God, we're not here to be entertained. We're not here to have our ears tickled. We came here for you. We came here for you, God. We thank you this morning. We acknowledge you. We acknowledge you that you're the motive of our hearts. You're the desire of our hearts, God. We are your church. The church of Jesus Christ. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we honor you, Lord. We hold nothing back. We just sung it, Lord. And what would we be if we sung lyrics like those and didn't mean it from our heart? We didn't come here to be religious this morning. We came here to meet with you and to know you and to look more like you, God. And so if there's anything that's holding us back, Anything we're aware of, anything we're not, make us aware of it, God. Expose it with your love and remove it. We're open to you, to your refining, to your pruning. Oh, God, we want what you have for us this morning. Would you help us open our hearts to receive it? Hello, hello, there we go, that's better. Oh my goodness, how amazing is it to worship Jesus? It's on? Technical help, that's good. Alrighty, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. Oh. Jesus is my saviour, but he's come to my rescue. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Oh. Well, it's an honour to be able to stand before you guys and share the word of God. Um, before we do, I just have a quick announcement. Uh, we're going to be having after the service a baptism. Uh, a precious sister by the name of Larissa. Some of you know her, some of you don't. But at 12.30, if you want to join us, we're going down to the lagoon at Stanley Park. And we're just going to baptize. We're going to celebrate new life. If you want to just get around her, we're just going to pray over her, believe over her, and celebrate with her. Uh, so if you'd like to be there, we'll be there. 12.30 at the lagoon. Whew. Wow. Well, this morning, the Lord's just, um, well, not this morning. He's put this on my heart for about, <laughs> about the past six months. Um, but this morning, I really feel like the Lord wants to share about... Um, Real, sincere hunger, what it means to truly hunger after God. Um, and I know a lot of us right now in this season, our church looks, it's probably gone through more change, at least in the time I've been here in the past six months and in, in the past few years, God is doing a lot and momentum is building here, momentum is building in our hearts. And I really believe God just wants to add fuel to that fire. Um, so yeah, I just want to speak about real true hunger before I do I just want to pray Lord Jesus would you open our hearts up to what it really means to hunger after you God we want, we want you to be our one desire would you move on our hearts in such a way that nothing else would satisfy and I thank you Father for releasing a grace this morning that takes us deeper into you in Jesus name Amen. Well, I want to turn with you guys, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be looking at some scripture in Philippians chapter 3. Mm. And Philippians chapter 3 is all about hunger. Oh, wow. Mm. So we're going to be reading from Philippians 3 verse 1. Oh, thank you, Lord. 
Are we ready? Yeah. All righty. So verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now what Paul's talking about here is in this church, in the Philippian church and in other churches, there was legalism that was trying to sneak into the body of Christ that said you have to obey uh, the, the rituals and the traditions of the law of Moses in order to attain salvation. You've got to be circumcised. And what he's warning and what, what's so adamant in the heart of God about that is he paid the price for us to have a free gift of salvation. It is a gospel of grace. Um, and what I've learnt and what I'm continuing to learn is that God, He doesn't tolerate what sometimes we've tolerated in the flesh. I was reading Galatians yesterday and it talks about that very thing about that same gospel that's not really a, another gospel, but it's people who want to twist the gospel of Christ that says Jesus plus and God the Father will not tolerate anyone or anything adding to the cross of Jesus Christ. He won't tolerate it. It says if anyone preaches another gospel than the grace gospel we preach to you, even if it was an angel from heaven, let them be accursed. God is adamant about his grace gospel. It's not the cross plus. It's only the cross of Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace through faith. And he's adamant about that. For we're the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus alone. And we have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I am also. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. So Paul's listing his pedigree here. He's saying, I was, the to I was top shelf. Everything about my life was perfect. I, I had all the boxes ticked. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was more zealous than anyone else in Judaism. I was persecuting the church. I was zealous. And some of you might feel like your zeal that you're walking in qualifies you, but it's a zeal according to the flesh. You can be unsaved and have a zeal, a passion for the things you believe in, for the things you're going after, but it's different to the Spirit of God. It's different to hunger and it's different to grace. But Paul says, all this stuff that was gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, the thing that you hold on to, whatever it is, the thing that you hold on to will be the thing that holds you back from Him. I'm serious, guys. The thing that you hold on to, whatever it is, however small you think it might be, it'll be the thing that holds you back from laying a hold of him. He's opened the door wide for us to come into his presence. He's opened the door wide for us to gain Christ. But the only way that that happens is if you consider everything else lost. If you think the things, the, the things that you once thought were advantageous, oh, I could really benefit from that. If that's got a hold of your heart, Jesus doesn't. That one thing, it'll be the thing that holds you back from him. And the life that we have, doesn't matter how long you live on this earth, it is precious and you only get one of them. And when you stand before Jesus Christ, even if you stand before Him and your sins are forgiven and you enter into eternal glory, you don't want to stand before Him on that day and go whoops because you realise there was something more and you held on to something that held you back from Him. 
Jesus requires you to hold on to him with both hands. You can't hold on to Jesus and on to something else. You have to let go and hold on to Christ with both hands. He's so precious, guys. If we'll really lay aside every other thing, pray, Jesus, strip me of every other desire. I don't want something else to have my heart. Then he'll lay a hold of us and we'll lay a hold of him and we'll fulfill our purpose as the church. We'll fulfill our destiny as sons and daughters. We don't want to hold back anything from him, guys. He's so deserving. He is so deserving of our lives. The reason you're in here on a Sunday, if you have any ounce of desire, it's because He's drawing you because He wants you. And when you see Him truly for who He is, when you see that, it makes you want Him. How do you think He works in us to, to desire and to do for His good pleasure? It's not, it's not that He's got remote controls and we're robots like, you will worship me. Dude. It's not like that. The way he draws us is with his loving kindness and with his grace. When you see that he's so much better, it wins your heart. Ephesians 4 talks about putting off the old and putting on the new. And it says your conduct that you used to live in, the conduct of the old man, which grows corrupt, it it just deteriorates and withers away according to the deceitful lusts. That word doesn't just mean looking at a pornography magazine. That word is an insatiable, self-centered desire. When you have a desire that's about you and self-indulgence and self-gratification, it's deceitful. Just take a little bite. You'll you'll be like God. You'll, You'll know good and evil. That thing that's tempting you, that's saying, that's enticing you and saying, this is where you'll gain satisfaction. This is where you'll find identity. It's deceitful. Has anyone seen someone play out this scenario or maybe played it out themselves? They're going after a deceitful lust. They're pursuing a desire that's not God, that's not satisfying. And they, they pursue it. They get a little taste of it and they think that didn't work. Maybe the answer is to pursue it even more. Has anyone seen that before or maybe experienced that? It's called a deceitful lust. It's called something that's been designed to take your affection away from Jesus And the snare is it's a hamster wheel. It's a carrot on a stick. Maybe if I get a little more of this thing, it'll satisfy me. And people waste years, decades and spend even their whole lives pursuing that. And then people, there there are wealthy people, people who've gotten everything they thought they could ever desire in this life. And then they pass away and their life amounts to a two inch signature on the bottom of a wheel. Didn't Jesus tell this parable? He said there was, there was a man whose who's, his crops, they, they flourished. And he said, what am I going to do? I don't have any space in my storehouses to keep all this wealth. Oh, I'm going to tear it all down. I'm going to build me a bigger barn. And I'm going to put all my stuff in there. And then I'm going to say to my soul, soul, you've done a pretty good job. Take your ease. Just sit back, chill, relax, and just enjoy life. But that night, God came and said, tonight your soul will be required of you, you fool. Who will will those things be that you've laid up for yourself? And it's like that with everyone who lays up treasure for themselves but isn't rich toward God. I want to be rich toward God. I want to be rich toward God. I don't want this stuff. This will all fade away one day. This I think it's a nice shirt anyway. This shirt, (laughs) this iPad, this church building, it's all temporary. This earth and everything in it is temporary. It will not last forever. Your days are temporary. They won't be forever. But it will be forever up there. And what happens right here is important to him, enough for it to be. If it wasn't important to God... He wouldn't have created us. He wouldn't have made time. He wouldn't have made this earth. This little wisp and a vapour is so important to God. I don't want to be rich to myself and not rich toward God. And 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 my hope and my prayer and my encouragement, my urging to all of you as your brother, as you're truly your brother, the blood of Jesus is thicker than water, is your real brother is that you would do the same thing that you would be rich toward God, 
that he could have all of your heart. That you wouldn't lay, sometimes the deceitful lust doesn't just look like the money or, or, the, or the experiences. Sometimes it's the desire to hurt on, hold on to hurt or offence or bitterness. Sometimes it's the desire to hold on to something that's killing you. Like John shared, sometimes it's the desire not to let go of the very thing that's destroying you. Don't hold on to it. If it's going to be foolish on that day when you stand before him, you won't get there and go, oh, I've got a few questions or yeah, but Lord. On the way to the throne, you'll go, whoops. It'll be open and exposed. And I do that often. I'd encourage you guys in your own faith and communion with the Lord, doing things like this, it stirs you because God, Holy Spirit, will make things real. I picture standing before Jesus on that day and I'm looking into his fiery eyes of eternal love. And there's not a single ounce of deception in the room. And even if there's something that's trying to press on me, an external feeling or a desire to live in the flesh, and I take that to him and I imagine I'm standing before him on that day and I see how grand and how amazing his truth is and how those deceitful desires, those lies, those contrary things pale in his presence. And I think if it's foolish on that day, I want it to be foolish to me today. I don't want the things that seem matter so much to the world to matter to me. If the church is pursuing, if the church is desiring, if the church is believing the same thing that the world that's in the sway of the wicked one is, that should be a red flag. Don't, do you guys agree? Don't you think it's concerning if the church is believing the same thing that the world is? If the church is believing, this is what I need. Oh, yeah, but uh, look, I, I know I, I believe in God, yeah, but can you, just, can, you just, can you just pray for me? I just feel sometimes we mask Christian language, we use Christian language to mask how we're actually doing on the inside. But God's saying, trusting me, having faith in me, desiring me is so much greater. If we just look, if we just take one moment to get our eyes off of all the stuff, who feels like sometimes you're being pulled in 10 different directions from the time you get up to the time you put your head on the pillow? Who's felt that way? Who's been feeling that way? If you lay all that stuff aside and take a moment just to look into his eyes by faith, just look into his eyes and sincerely say, be vulnerable before the Lord. He knows everything about you any, anyway. You think you're hiding things from God? You're not hiding anything from God. He knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knew you before you were even known. He's known your days before there was any of them. He knows you. He wants you to open up to him. He loves you. In our lives, there's been people that we didn't want to open up to because we felt like we couldn't trust them with the vulnerability or the information or that they'd hurt us. Sometimes we've been hurt. Maybe our parents hurt us. We felt like I couldn't open up to someone who I see as an authority figure in my life because I've done that in the past and I got stung. But he's not like that. He knows everything and he loves you and you can be vulnerable before him. And if there's anything in your heart, and I know I'm sharing passionately and sometimes you can hear that in a negative ear where you think, oh, I've got a, a, a mile to go. But that's not the case. Often that's not the case. A lot of the time we have good hearts and there's so much that God's doing, but sometimes there's a little fox that tries to spoil the precious fruit of the vine. It's a little desire. It's a little wrong belief. It's a little bit of hurt and it's, it's subtle. But you can, you can say, Holy Spirit, turn up the lights, turn up the heat. I want, you to, I want you to illuminate me from the inside out. I want to see clearly. Because if I see clear, I be clear. If my, if my eye is the lamp of my body and this thing determines everything about my life, I want this thing to be so clear. I want it to be single, one focus, one pursuit, the King of glory. I don't want to have my eyes on anything else. I want to trust Jesus. Come on. Aren't you tired of being afraid? Yeah. Aren't you tired of feeling like you want to reach out and give the world Jesus, but there's things that are holding you back? Aren't you tired? 
of letting little things, letting the enemy have a voice in your life? Don't you want to walk in freedom? Don't you want to be free? Don't you just want to express who he is to the world? Don't you just want to know your God? Don't you just want to be close to Papa? Don't you just want to know him? I'm telling you, we can know him. We can know him and the promise is certain that we can know him. Whew, Jesus. I want, to, I want to read on. We're going to read on. He says, yeah, I, I count everything lost because knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, is way better. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. See, when you're totally yielded to, to Christ, you're found in him. And you don't have to justify yourself. You see, when you hold on to other things and you're pursuing something that's not him, you're, especially after hearing something like this, your conscience is aware of it. And, and there's not a day that will go by, even if you push it down or keep it at the back, where your conscience isn't going like a, like a little GPS. Bloop, bloop, bloop. You're just aware. And that's because the love of God is unfailing and he'll never stop that because he loves you. He'll never stop moving on your life because he wants all of you. But when you're in that place, you have to defend yourself. You don't have, you're not enjoying and embracing and receiving the free gift of righteousness. Who's ever seen someone or found themselves in, in a position where they knew what they were going after or what they were doing wasn't quite God, even if it, you thought it wasn't, oh, it wasn't that bad and you actually, in your mind, you had to justify it or someone spoke about it and you got defensive, like, hey, don't judge me. When you live in that way, you're not letting God be your justifier. You're living in a form of self-righteousness. You have to justify yourself and it's such a burden. You can't justify yourself. But if you lean into him, and you lean into letting him be your pursuit and desire, you won't have to. You'll embrace a righteousness that comes from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Woo! And I'm the only one who celebrates that one. No, I don't believe that. Being conformed to his death, if by any means... I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I don't know, has, has if anyone here has experienced this before, who's, who's ever suffered for Jesus in some way and you actually found that there was a joy to it? Whether it was someone who rejected you, whether it was someone who mistreated you, who misinterpreted your motives or your actions, and you actually found there was a joy there and instead of getting frustrated, you found a compassion in your heart towards them. There is a joy to the fellowship of his sufferings. There is actually a treasure to suffering like he suffered. I, I remember experiencing this a couple months ago. I was at Town Hall and I was coming home uh, just from being with a few people who were preaching the gospel out there. And I, I was down, I don't know if you've ever been to the city stations where they've got the platforms inside and I'm just standing there and I've got about 60 seconds and I look and there's a bunch of people and I think, yeah, I can share a little bit quickly before we get on the train. And um, I discovered something about uh, 11.30 at night at Town Hall. There's usually on a Friday night, there's usually a bunch of metalhead en enthusiasts who come from uh, like obviously listening to some form of heavy metal. I start lifting my voice. Hey, guys, I just want to let you know. And I start talking about the hope that's in Jesus. And this woman fully starts manifesting and like screaming like, how the effing blank and the dare you share your da 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 da. And I'm just like... Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus loves you and I'm just sharing. And, and it's, it's funny, a, a little bit, I, like I'm not judging this lady, but like the hypocrisy and the blindness of the world. She's going on about me sharing my opinion but she, and preaching at people. And like I just said, hi, like I don't want to let you guys encourage you that there's hope in Jesus. And she's preaching more passionately than I am. <laughs> um, but I love them. I got on the same, the same carriage as them. And I, uh, and I sat down. And I'm like, wow. 
I just, with a, the, like an ear-to-ear smile on my face, was just going through the scriptures just on my phone about, blessed are you when they revile, they insult, persecute you, great is your reward in heaven. Peter says, the spirit of glory and God rests on you. Imagine, imagine if you saw it that way, when you're approaching someone, you think, oh, they might insult or reject me or do something, they might t- not take it well. And you actually thought, hold on, if they respond like that, it's like a magnet for the spirit of God to rest on me. You get addicted to just sharing with people no matter what. And if you experience that joy that I could suffer like you suffered, it's, it's way better. I've found more joy suffering for Jesus than I have indulging in the pleasures of the world. There is more joy in su- his sufferings than there is in this world's pleasures. <sighs> wow. I'm going to read on. From verse 12, Paul says, Not that I have already attained... Or am already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. That means that Jesus laid a hold of us with intention. He, he, he laid a hold of us for a purpose. He didn't just die on the cross for us to say, I love you and I forgive you. But he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to restore our purpose restore our identity where we walk in union with his heart and in union with his Holy Spirit. And Paul said, I haven't got there yet. Some of us, we look at men and women of God who we honour and we esteem and sometimes we've let that be a stumbling block where we're like, well, even such and such, they haven't seen that, they haven't done that. Or, or you know, I'll use myself as an example. Um, or even, even Ethan, you know, he prayed for that person and nothing happened. But me or anyone else isn't the standard. Jesus is the standard. If something in my life looks like Jesus, celebrate it and go after it. If there's something or anything in my life that doesn't look like Jesus, you love me, you honour what's on my life, but you don't follow that, you follow Jesus. Sometimes we get tricked into following one another more than we do the Lord. And then we actually allow human experience to, to be bigger and what the grace of God wants to do in our life and we cap ourselves off and we put a ceiling on our head. I don't want a ceiling on my head. I want Jesus to come just like uh, in John 3 and the other Gospels where with zeal, he enters into the house of God. Who's the house of God now? He comes into the house of God with a threefold cord and he overturns the tables, he flips every table, he cleans me out and makes me a house of prayer again. I want to be that. I don't want any table set up where it's, where it's a, a house of mer- merchandise, a den of thieves. I want every table to be overturned so that all there is is Jesus. Paul, in his last letter before being beheaded by the Romans, he writes to his son Timothy and he says, in a, in a great house, in a big, big house, you'll find imp- instruments and implements that are precious and some that are ordinary. Some are made of gold and silver some of are made of wood and, and clay. And he says, if a man cleanses himself from all of these things, all of it, he'll be a vessel that's uh, honourable, which is valuable, set apart and very useful for the master, made ready for every good work. There was an exhortation where you're the house and whether it's made of gold and silver or whether it's made of wood and clay, I'm ready for every good work. I'm an empty house, swept clean and ready for Jesus to take up residence. I don't want things in my life. We don't want things in our life that hold, hold him back from flowing in our lives and flowing through our lives. We want him. And we can have as much of him as, as we want, guys, but the reality is, is as much of him as we want is as much of him as we, we give of ourselves. He can, you can have as much of him as he can have of you. It's a pretty fair, fair, fair deal, don't you think? You can have as much of God as he can have of you and... And as much of him as is seen in your life is, is the evidence, it's the fruit of how much you're actually going after. You can have him. You can have him, guys. So Paul says that. He says, that's why I'm going after this thing, so that I can lay a hold of what he laid a hold of me for. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but there's one thing I do. Not two things, not three things. There's one thing that ensures I lay a hold of that very thing for which Christ Jesus has laid a hold of me. Forgetting those things which are behind 
and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's the upward call of God in Christ? Through Christ, God has said, come up hither. He's called us up. Sit where I sit. Live from the place I live from. Live one with my heart. And there's one thing we do, guys, to lay a hold of that. It's to forget what's back there. But I didn't have a very good childhood growing up. Forget what's back there. He's worthy. He's worth it. But I never, I never knew what it was to have a loving father. Well, he's your loving father and he's always been your father. Don't associate your dad who didn't love you well to the father because that will keep you back. Forget what's behind. Don't let, the, don't let the thing behind you be the thing you're holding on to. Remember, you can only hold on to Jesus with both hands. And if you let go of that, oh my goodness, the joy, if you let go of what's behind, forget that. He's not looking back there, neither should you. And you look at him and you pursue him. He will cause you to lay a hold of that call, that upward call. Don't you guys want to walk in that? I want to walk in that. I don't care. I don't care. In, not in a disrespectful sense, what I mean is it doesn't matter to me. It's not going to dictate my pursuit, even if anyone around me is going after this or not. Even if anyone in the past I've seen, you know, the amazing men of God in, in the past who, who I even honour and love and respect men and women, and if I didn't see them or it didn't, uh, lay hold of that fullness, I'm not going to go, well, if they didn't get it, I'm not going to. Guys, at the end of the age, that'll be revealed as unbelief. You put more trust in a human experience and testimony than you did in God's testimony, which is that he gave us life and that life is found in his son. We can have him. He's such a pre precious treasure and a prize. So, guys, we're going to forget what lies behind us and we're going to go ahead and lay a hold of what's in front of us, which is, which is him. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. You might think, I don't feel very mature. Well, listen to this. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. Which means doesn't matter how far ahead you think you are, what rung on the spiritual ladder you believe you're on, whether you've been saved for a day, a year or a decade, whether you feel like you've run well or not, let us all have the same mind. Forgetting what's back there and going ahead for Jesus, pursuing him, laying a hold of him. Guys, we can all have that mind. And his faith and mine is if we're thinking any other way, God will... God will reveal that to us. He will reveal that to you. Brother, I received a revelation from the Lord today. <laughs> he showed me I was, I was thinking in, a, in this way, but he wants me to think that way. Imagine receiving that revelation from God. You're actually living this way. I, I, I heard of a man who he played, he's the actor, who's watched The Chosen before? The man, the man who plays Zebedee, he's got such a, a powerful testimony. He came onto the show not saved and he's had a radical encounter with God and he's in love with and on fire for Jesus. Uh, he was at this uh, meeting he was invited to and he was an hour and he's like, this is really weird. People are dancing like ballerinas. Oh, this feels wacky, but I'm just going to pray. And so he begins to pray and the, woman, the, the pastor, she gets up and she says, I want people to bury their idols. And he thinks, I don't have an, any idols. And then this voice came and said, oh, actually you do, you're acting career, your voice over career, your mum, your dad, your sister, your brothers-in-law, oh, your car, your Jeep commander, your bank accounts. Oh. And he went, wow, that really, really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> like, ouch, that stung. And so he got on his knee and he began to give him over to Jesus. And he said, for the first time in my life, he was raised Greek Orthodox, for the first time in my life, I truly gave it over. And I said, I just want to be with you now, God. I just want to be with you now, God. And he has a radical encounter that night with, um, with the Lord Jesus. He gets set ablaze. And now he's burning for the Lord. He's like, all I want is Jesus. And I just address him and he's right there. He's always with me. And all he wants is Jesus. It's so beautiful. But I watched this. The presence of God was just all over me just listening to this guy's interview. He's going after Jesus. And we can too, guys. We can pursue him. 
And I'm going to finish up just on, on, the, on the chapter. From verse 17, it's, Paul says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly and their glory is in their shame. What's the problem? What causes them to live this way? Enemies of the cross of Christ. That's intense language. They set their mind on earthly things and not on the things above. Our citizenship's in heaven from which we also also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And in the beginning of chapter 4, Paul summarizes what he said and he, he urges him. He says, Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. When we live this way, it produces a steadfastness. When we don't live this way, our whole Christianity is like this. It's just an upward and downward roller coaster. But if you set your heart and your affection on Jesus and Jesus alone, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. If my treasure is set in heavenly places, no thief's going to approach and steal it. No moth or rust is going to destroy it. If my treasure isn't in a vulnerable place, neither will my heart be. Doesn't, do, doesn't that sound amazing? Don't you want your heart to be in a place where it's not vulnerable anymore, to be tossed around by this world? Guys, we can live steadfast in the Lord. Mm. I want to pr- pray and then I just want to give an opportunity just to open up the altar just for ministry. If you uh, just want to take a step of faith and say, you know what, I'm just going to lay things down here at the altar and I'm going to pick up you, Jesus, and pursue in you. If maybe you're in here and you don't know Jesus at all, but what I'm sharing is convicting you and moving on your heart and you say, I want, I want him, I want this Jesus that's being t- spoken about. You can come as well. I encourage you, be brave. Come down the front. We'd love to pray with you and you can surrender over to Jesus. But I just want to pray over us now and then we'll we'll open up the altar. Father, I thank you for every hungry heart in this room this morning. God, I thank you that we couldn't even hunger after you if it wasn't for you. If it wasn't for your grace and your mercy, Holy Spirit, we wouldn't even care. But I thank you that we do and that you are merciful. And I pray right now, God, that on each and every one of our hearts, this conviction would settle. You would mark us. We would go after you. And if in any way we're thinking otherwise, myself included, God, I ask that you would reveal that to us. Not to condemn us or bring us, bring us down. You don't operate that way. But to call us higher and lift us up and out of that and into you. Father, I thank you for that grace. I thank you, God, for the hunger. I just see you honouring the sincerity of the hearts here in the room represented this morning. God, our hearts have desired you, and I thank you that this is just adding fuel to what you're doing. It's removing things that shouldn't be, and you're just causing your bride to be pure and healthy and run well. God, I release that grace over all of us, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much, guys. If you, yeah, like I said, if you'd like to just respond and move on your heart, please, please come down the front. It's not about standing before man. You're just taking a step of faith and standing before God, and we'd love to just pray with you and encourage you. Thank you, guys.